Hello and welcome to Tonight at 8 from the RSGB. Amateur radio does not normally play a major part in matters of state importance, but 40 years ago this weekend it was the only link and enabled the UK to find out what was really happening in the Falklands. The man who made this vital contact was Laurie Margolis, G3 UML, and he's with us now to take us through this incredible story. Welcome to Tonight at 8, Laurie. Could you give us a brief preview of what you'll be talking about this evening? Yeah, we're going to be focusing mostly on April the 2nd, 1982, just a couple of days over 40 years ago, when the Argentinians invaded the Falklands. They announced it. There were many hours of confusion, which were not really sorted out until a conversation I had with VP8LP uh, later on that afternoon, in which he graphically described what was going on in the islands. And uh, I went on BBC Radio with it, and the rest is history. Well, we're really looking forward to it, Laurie. And before your presentation, a reminder that if you're watching this at home now on Monday, the 4th of April, then this is live. And you can ask questions and make comments on either BATC or YouTube at any time during the presentation or straight afterwards. Please include your first name and call sign if you have one within every message. I note that you can make this video stream fill your screen on most devices, usually by double clicking on the picture or pressing the full screen button. But now, is back to Laurie. Thanks very much indeed, David. Very, very good evening, everyone. All I can see on the screen coming back to me is two versions of me, so I'm not clear who's out there, but um, I'll carry on talking and uh, uh, you can throw abuse or make rude gestures or whatever you like. Um, uh, just to explain a little bit about who I am, um, I work at BBC News and have done for the thick end of, would you believe, 48 years now, which is almost incredible. I'm a senior journalist in the newsroom in Broadcasting House. That is the thing you see at the beginning of the news bulletins where that big shot goes down into the uh, into the newsroom. I sit down there. We'll be doing so tomorrow from 10.45. And depending on the day, work on either home or foreign news for either radio or television or the continuous news channels. So um, I work for what is known as the news gathering side of news. Um, news, news has two sides. There is news gathering, which is basically the people who are out there reporting, taking pictures, the, ca the, the, the filming video, the camera crews who are out there, the engineers and the satellite trucks and the, the these days the various cellular phone systems for getting everything back. And then there are the people in the newsroom who actually prepare the stuff and get it on the air, the production people who make it look right, edit it, do all the graphics around it, write the intros for the for the presenters, or they write their own intros. And um, so that's the other side of the operation. So I've nearly always worked on the news gathering side, either as a radio reporter or television reporter, or um, as I do now as a news gathering editor. So my job is to make sure the news we know about is covered, the news that turns up during the day or that we don't know about is reacted to, and to get the resources and the people and the technical equipment out there to enable the story to be covered and got back and uh, got onto your television or your radio or increasingly these days onto your, your um, online computer screen. So what we are going to talk about today is a brief period in 1982 when there was a fantastic story of which for a while I was the sole custodian and uh, how, we, how we actually got that on the air and it was really quite a bit more simple than it is now. So um, th 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 that's a little bit a bit about me. L let me just sort of go through a bit, a bit of history of the Falkland Islands. You, you will have heard of them. You'll know they're off the coast of South America. Their amateur radio call sign is VP8. They have some dependent territories nearby, South Georgia, South Shetland, South Sandwich Islands, um, um, maybe, maybe one I've forgotten, I can't remember which count in, in radio terms as separate countries. They're pretty rare. The Falklands is relatively straightforward to work because there are two or three very active stations there and quite often people passing through. The other ones are much more difficult. So um, South Sandwich, South Georgia are very, very rarely on. South Shetland does tend to get on because there are bases there from various countries. So South Shetland, you can normally work, but the others are, um, are, are really quite difficult. So, um, that's the Falkland Islands, first sighted probably by the French in 1504. And they were part of a shuttlecock between Britain, France and Spain going through the age of exploration, the age of colonial conquest going into the 19th century. 
Uh, the name came in 1764 from France. Uh, they were known by the French as the Ile Malouine because the people who had settled down there were from Saint-Malo, the port in, in, in northwestern France on the Channel Coast. That uh, translated into Spanish as the Malvinas, which is what the um, Argentinians certainly still call them. We, as I say, a lot of to and fro and battling and deciding who had what jurisdiction over which part of South America. It, it went, on, went on forever. And eventually the British um, took over in 1833. There was nobody living there at the time. The British settled the place and it became, first of all, a British colony. And then I, I think what they now call the British um, Crown Dependency or a, a self-governing territory or something like that. So that's where the Falklands are now. All went awfully wrong in 1982 when the Argentines attacked and took over and controlled the place for seven or controlled the place up to a point for 74 days until the famous task force went in and basically booted them out. So um, what we're going to do now, I'm just going to run you a little BBC film about the history of the Falklands and a brief run through the whole campaign just so you're kind of orientated on that. And then I will talk a little bit more about my interest in it. So, um, uh, Tammy, if we could play that first tape, please. It was a war on the other side of the world. On April the 2nd, 1982, Argentine forces invaded the Falkland Islands and claimed it as their own. The task force, with all its power, is ready. Britain <coughs> has gathered its might. It must set its course. Accompanied by the late Brian Hanrahan for the BBC, a task force of more than 100 ships had set sail within days to make the 8,000-mile journey to liberate the islands. I thought we'd better get ready and take it seriously, but I'm not quite sure that I absolutely believe we'd do it. But as they sail south, resolve hardened. First, with the controversial sinking of the Argentine cruiser, the General Belgrano with the loss of 323 lives. It would be the largest air and sea battle involving British forces since the Second World War. A hundred aircraft and more than 20 ships would either be destroyed or damaged. Julian Thompson was the man charged with the initial British landings at San Carlos on the 21st of May. Luckily, it was thick fog. So the Argentine Air Force never found us. They, we knew they were trying to find us. We could hear them zooming around and uh, trying to find us. They might have created a bit of mayhem had they done so. That was a bit I was really worried about. Goose Green was the first time British paratroopers came face to face with the enemy. The British lost 18 men, among them friends of Paul Bishop, who was just 21. After we'd two casualties and, and friends had been killed, there was, in my, you know, my feelings was, was hate towards them, you know. We, you know, we wanted to take out as many as we could. We wanted to remove them from the islands. Later, Paul witnessed this, the Argentine attacks at Bluff Cove, where the British lost more than 50 men. <laughs> We're now between the two gun lines and there's a right old artillery duel going on between them. The battle on the ground took just over a month. On the 14th of June, the Argentines surrendered. 649 of them lost their lives. The British had lost 255 men. So what will the 40th anniversary mean for these veterans? I personally don't expect anything from, from the country, from the government, you know, we, we just, volunteered to do it and we did it. It'd be nice to be remembered. I visit the San Carlos Cemetery and um, usually shed a tear there uh, and look out over that peaceful water and remember what it was like with guns firing and ships being hit and aeroplanes bombing. And those contrasts is really quite remarkable. 40 years on from a war on the other side of the world, but they are still remembered. Jonathan Beale, BBC News. So that kind of sets out the story for you about um, how we got there and what the battle was about. And I think you can see there, maybe younger viewers amongst you are not so familiar with this, the older ones probably will be, but I think what you can see there is this was a really nasty encounter. This was a very intense short war. It went on for uh, just under two months. 
but um, a lot of people got killed, a lot of people got desperately injured, an awful lot of ships went to the bottom. I think it was seven British ships altogether. Um, a lot of aircraft were shot down. It was a really nasty encounter. So that's the broader picture. So why am I sitting here telling you about it? Well, a couple of days before all this happened, I was actually in the Middle East. I was making a radio program in Israel. And I was up in on the Golan Heights in the um, the Israeli occupied part of Syria up in the up in the north of Israel and driving around and listening on the car radio to a rather uh, scratchy medium wave signal coming from the BBC in Cyprus and hearing this rather bizarre story about scrap metal merchants landing in South Georgia. And that was how this began. Um, South Georgia, a Falkland Islands dependency originally a whaling base so there's a lot of stuff down there a lot of metal a lot of cranes a lot of sort of port installations all rusting and falling apart and there was a very small British detachment there I think very small number of, Br of British troops and all of a sudden these Argentine um, as they called them scrap metal merchants they didn't appear to be soldiers turned up on the islands and started carving stuff off and, and hauling it away without permission. It was and it, it was um, caused some astonishment, first of all, because most people didn't know where it was. It was an awfully long way away, but also thinking what the hell do the Argentines think they're up to? So that was going on on the 31st. Um, I, you know, listened to it with some interest. Obviously, as, as a radio amateur, you start hearing about rare islands, you, uh, you react a bit. And I then... Um, came back the following day on the 1st of April with a whole pile of tapes to edit for a Radio 4 programme about Israel and woke up that morning and was conscious of the fact that there were listened to the news and it was saying that the Argentines were claiming that they had invaded the Falkland Islands there was no proof there was a rather cryptic message I think from cable and wireless saying something like we have new friends and then they went off the air um, there was no communications and you know this was in the days before there was no internet there was no emails there were may have just been the very early cellular phones and the very earliest personal computers there but effectively the communication was by phone and telex um, television signals were being transmitted by satellite but by enormous satellite dishes or else film that was flown home and um, th things were cut off in an awfully long way away Anyway, I sort of registered this, went into Broadcasting House about um, 10, 11 o'clock in the morning with a pile of tapes to be met by scenes of near panic in, in the newsroom. And people came rushing over to me and said, um, th th there's an amateur radio station here, isn't there? And I said, yes, it's in the Langham building over the road. Now, those of you who know the area, I will show you a piece of me reporting from there later on. But um, new Broadcasting House, that's that new sort of super duper building that you see on the beginning of all the news bulletins still centered around the original 1930s broadcasting house, which is a rather, a rather lovely building built to look like a cruise liner. Over the road is now a very expensive hotel called the Langham Hotel, but at the time it was a very grotty, rather sad, knocked about BBC office block called the Langham. Had been a hotel in Edwardian days, then had become a BBC block, had been hit by a bomb during the war and was a a oh, strange old place of echoing corridors and clanky lifts that went, went up and down, sort of lift doors closing with enormous noise and a lot of administration and stuff there. Allegedly one of the most haunted buildings in London as well. One of uh, our newsreaders used to tell us that there, there was a room there where the newsreaders used to uh, spend the night if they were doing a split shift, reading the late and the early newses and how he was physically thrown out of bed by one of these um, one of these manifestations. So it's 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 quite an interesting place. Um, and on the top of it in those days, right at the top was an amateur radio station. Now I used to use this occasionally. And it was actually quite good. It had for those of you who remember a um, Yesu FT200 transceiver, which was a decent little 100 watt uh, valve transceiver of that um, early 80s era. It had an FL2100 linear, which was a, a pair of 572Bs, decent little Yesu linear. And uh, I think it was a TA33 or a TH3 tri-band beam on the roof. And th that was up pretty high. That was probably about um, 100, 120 feet above the ground. And um, it, it, I used to, you'd have thought it would be very noisy there, but it wasn't bad. And it was a pretty good station. I used to go up there occasionally and the signal was good and people would call you and it was, um, it was quite fun to use. So I said, yes, this station is there. 
And they said, can you get in touch with the Falklands? We can't, uh, we, we don't know what's going on. The Argentinians are claiming they've, that they've invaded. We can't, we can't get hold of anybody. Um, I said, sure, I'll give it a try. I said, I'm, I don't know what's going to happen. So I go up there into this dusty old room. It's full of old electronic gear and junk and dusty magazines and stuff like that. And um, I start listening and I thought, well, VP8 probably going to be, conditions were quite good. It's probably going to be 15, 10 metres. Um, I knew there was a fairly regular 20 metre net involving the VP8s, but that, that wouldn't have been propagation at that time. And I listened and listened and listened. And I think it was about three o'clock in the afternoon, I suddenly hear something which makes my, the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. And it was a slightly West Country voice, um, a fairly distinctive accent that you, you would have said was probably West Country. And he was talking about the Falklands and he was talking about the invasion, talking to, uh, I think, some friends in Britain at the time. By the way, I, sh I should say, I was not the first one to learn of this. I was the first one to report it. I would emphasize that because there were people talking to him probably an hour or so before I was. But um, I was the first one to actually move it out into the, uh, into the, into the wider arena. So um, I listened to this and I thought, whoa, this is really quite interesting. And um, so I called in over the top, the signal was big. And I really, he wasn't giving his call sign, of course. And I realized I knew who this guy was. I had worked him not long before. He was a guy called Bob McLeod. He was a plumber. And crucially, he was in Goose Green. Now, why is this crucial? Because a lot of people have said to me, well, how was he transmitting if the Argentinians were, um, were all over the islands? Well, the point is at that stage, they weren't all over the islands. They were in Port Stanley and around Port Stanley, but Goose Green's about 50 miles away from Port Stanley. And so he was still in unoccupied territory and was able to report. How did he know what was going on? Very simple answer, two meters. The VP8s had a VHF net, which went right around the islands. Almost everybody had a call sign there. They didn't have to take the exam or anything. So virtually everybody had a station. They had a call sign and maybe not interested in sort of DXing or that sort of thing, but certainly were interested in keeping in touch with each other on, on VHF. Um, just to sort of give you the what uh, Goose Green looks like and what happened there, Tammy, can we run the Goose Green BFBS story, please? Today is the 30th anniversary of the Battle of Goose Green in the Falkland Islands. The Argentines surrendered following two days of fierce fighting, which cost 17 British lives, including their commanding officer, Colonel H. Jones. Tim Cooper looks back at the first decisive land battle of the conflict. Goose Green, a small settlement on East Falkland, a school, a few houses, a sheep station and around 100 residents. On the 29th of May 1982, though, Argentine troops were dug in around Goose Green and nearby Darwin. As two para prepared to advance, they thought they'd have to deal with around 500 troops. Only later would they find that 1,200 Argentines were dug in and waiting. The battle was fierce and lasted 14 hours, darkness giving way to dawn, allowing the Argentine heavy machine guns licensed to rake the barren terrain. Two para's commander, Lieutenant Colonel H. Jones, was killed during the fighting, his gallant actions leading to a posthumous Victoria Cross. It was by no means a walkover for the British, although ultimately their vastly superior training and leadership at all levels won through. As the Argentines surrendered, the full extent of their numbers became clear. Many were conscripts, their nationalist belief in the Malvinas, if they had any, clearly diminished by the Falklands winter. BBC reporter Brian Hanrahan spoke to members of Two Para after their victory. You had one big battle already at Goose Green. You learned any lessons from that? Learned a lot of lessons. Mm -hmm. What sort of things? Well, fighting through. Just keep on going. There's no stop, no turning back. It's just straight through. Well, we've got to do, haven't we? No, we can't just jack halfway. In the UK, the news of the first campaign was relayed to the nation. We have just learned that the 2nd Battalion of the Parachute Regiment has taken Darwin and Goose Green. Back at Goose Green, evidence of Argentine napalm bombs were uncovered. Fortunately, they were never deployed. Meanwhile, at senior level, the battle had helped shape future operations. And I thought what we'll do is bank on being better trained than they are, which we'd now prove we were, and therefore the chaos of fighting at night 
we would be able to overcome that chaos quicker than them. 47 Argentines died at Goose Green. 17 British personnel lost their lives. They were laid to rest <coughs> close to where they fell. Lieutenant Colonel Jones. Captain Wood. Captain Jane. What about the rightness of it all? Um, well, it started off as British soil. Uh, Argies barged in. And we're here to kick them out. And that they would do. But there were many days of hard fighting ahead. Tim Cooper, Forces News. OK, so th that sets out what happened at Goose Green. Bear in mind, most of that stuff was shot at the end of May. And what we're talking about is the beginning of April. So there was Bob in, in, that, um, in, in that village on the um, other side of, of East Falkland, some way from Port Stanley, and able to transmit. So anyway, I called him and um, said, uh, hi, Bob. I think I, I used my own call sign, actually, not the BBC call sign, because I thought he recognised me. And I uh, said, hi, Bob, I'm here at the BBC. What's going on? And he came back with something which I'll read to you here. From, he said, um, amongst other things, Laurie, why is the BBC still saying they don't know whether the Falklands has been invaded? We have now been taken over. The British government still denies it, but they have no contact, I believe, with the Falklands, and this is probably why they're still denying it. But we have been taken over. There's an aircraft carrier and I believe four other boats. I don't have details on them, but they do have heavy, heavy armoured vehicles in Stanley. Details I don't know and quite a number of personnel. They landed at approximately 9.30 this morning in landing craft, stormed the capital Port Stanley and have taken over the government office. They landed with heavy armoured vehicles. We're now under their control. They are broadcasting that all local people will be treated as normal, fairly peaceful in Stanley at the present time. So, wow, um, I have got this story on, I've recorded it on, uh, some of you may remember the Ewer tape recorder that radio reporters used in those days, a little five inch German made, very, very well made um, reel to reel tape recorder. Recorded it on there just with, the, with the, mic, the microphone up against the speaker. There was nothing elaborate about it. And I had this stuff there. And I was sitting there by myself with this bombshell in my hand and um, sort of wondering what to do with it. Now, one of the things about news, it's all very well finding a great story, but it's not a great deal of use until you can tell someone else about it. It's not just finding the story. It's actually getting the story out there. And in this case, getting the story out there involved running down seven floors or taking the lift down seven floors, running across Langham Place, the top of Regent Street, into Broadcasting House, up to the newsroom and uh, trying to get it on the air. So we're talking probably about four o'clock in the afternoon now. And um, word is kind of already getting out that I was up there and possibly communicating with the islands. And there were some other press were turning up at that stage, some newspaper reporters and a couple of television cameras turned up in this um, grotty old room at the top of the Langham. Anyway, I, I didn't really want to break away from the radio station, but there was I, I needed to go down and explain what I had and get this stuff on the air. So I go over the road to the to the radio newsroom where I where I worked. And in those days, there was no 24 hour news. There was no five live. There was no Sky News. I don't even think CNN had started broadcasting then. So we had the set programmes. We had the, the lunchtime news, the tea time news, the evening news, the radio bulletins were exactly the same as the, are exactly the same now as they were then, one o'clock, six o'clock, ten o'clock. And the next news programme on was the PM programme um, at five o'clock. So you have got the World at One and PM are made by the same team of people. And now they do the Broadcasting House programme on Sunday morning as well. And uh, that is a, a news, um, what we call a sequence programme, putting on stories one after the other. Not necessarily like a news bulletin. They could do softer stories as well, but um, they would certainly expect to be doing the, the lead story in some detail. So they were the next ones on. So I went into there and waved this piece of tape in, the reel of tape, and I said, you know, this is it. This is a guy on the Falklands telling us it's all over, that the, um, the ship's in the bay, troops all over town, the broadcasting station's broadcasting in Spanish, Governor General is in um, is under arrest, and um, that's it. So PM went to put me and this on at the top of the programme, and it, it caused something of a sensation. I was, uh, curiously enough, the one program that didn't really carry it was the following six o'clock news, the one, the six o'clock news that evening. 
who were you know, very, very careful. They still weren't quite certain about this sourcing. And so they went ahead with what the British government was saying, what the Argentinians were saying. And um, they, they uh, kind of um, let that side of the story go. I think television picked it up much more strongly later on that evening. So I go back to the up to the um, room in the top of the Langham and uh, have a couple more conversations with Bob. And I've just got another bit of stuff here that uh, I wrote into an online piece some time ago, which again, I'll re read through because it's all very relevant. Damage we don't know, shooting around a very roughly two hours, three deaths of Argentinians in the Falklands, one believed to be very senior. The English Marines and local defence forces, we have no information, although we were later told there were no injuries there. Took over Government House, taken over all of Port Stanley, and I believe they shot up the cable and wireless transmitting station. Helicopters flying around Stanley, 500 personnel in Stanley, the aircraft carrier believed to be carrying 1,500 people. Flying Hercules aircraft, one has come in. So it was over. They were there, they were in control. The British, uh, the small British garrison had... Uh, had surrendered and it was um, not one of our more glorious episodes. Um, very soon after that, so it was after I'd gone on the air at five o'clock, must have been about 10 past, quarter past five, I was back up in the new room, the phone goes, there's, there's a phone in this office, which I don't think had rung for 30 years, there's kind of dust coming off it as it was ringing. And I answer it and it's um, someone from the foreign office. I said, oh, Miss Margolis, um, so-and-so from the foreign office, I said, hello said, um, understand you've been talking to the Falklands. I said, I have. I said, well, you know, what were they saying to you? And um, I went through the whole story. I said, Argentine ship in the bay, troops all over town, Argentine flag flying over government house, government under arrest, Argentina, you know, broadcasting station now broadcasting in Spanish, I think. He said, oh, right, thank you very much. And off he went and at six o'clock, Lord Carrington, who was then the Foreign Secretary, so he was actually speaking in the House of Lords rather than the rather than the House of Commons. He stood up and confirmed, pretty much repeated what I had said, what I had told this guy from the Foreign Office and what I'd said on the radio. Now, just to jump forward here, interestingly enough, um, I had always assumed that they would have had a lot of information. There wasn't satellite surveillance in those days, but from monitoring radio, from spies, from, you know, clandestine sources on the islands, all sorts of things. I assume they would have other sources. 30 years later, um, the Cabinet Papers were released. Now, as you may know, they have this release of Cabinet Papers usually around Christmas every year. Some of them are 30 years old, some which are more crucial are 70 years old and some will never be released. So in other words, I understand the ones involving the abdication of Edward VIII in 1936 are never going to be released. But um, there was a release of cabinet papers on the 30th, it wasn't even the 30th anniversary, it was the end of 2012. <clears throat> Thought nothing about it at all, Still, the phone goes one afternoon, it was just after Christmas. And a friend says, um, Laurie, I'm looking at the cabinet papers, I'm down at Kew, where they're kept, and uh, you're in them. I said, right, well, what, what, <laughs> what, what did I say? <clears throat> they sent me this um, piece of paper, which I can hold up here. You can see, you know, I, I won't read all of this, but um, it is copied. A man called Mr. Hulse at the Defence Department copied to all sorts of a couple of ministerial names I recognise. And places like the MOD Defence Situation Centre and all sorts of spooky stuff like this. Um, I have spoken to an amateur radio ham at the BBC by the name of Margolis. That certainly put me in my place who's been in touch with an amateur radio operator situated some 50 miles away from Port Stanley. According to Mr. Margolis, the Argentines attacked at 0935 GMT, an overwhelming force using landing craft and heavily armoured vehicles. Only Port Stanley was attacked. There was shooting for three hours during which the cable and wireless headquarters was damaged. Some 500 Argentines landed. It's thought another 1500 remained on board the ships, an aircraft carrier and four or five other vessels. Ceasefire was arranged, governor and personnel taken into custody, Argentines making arrangements to fly them back to the UK. I think they were treated pretty correctly. Three Argentines hurt in the shooting, none among, among the Marines. A tape recording has been given to the radio newsroom and I presume extracts from that will be broadcast tonight. Well, you bet they will be. Um, then there's another bit. I spoke again to Mr. Margolis at 1710 BST who confirmed the situation was still quiet. 
added the following clarification to his earlier account. The Marines have been included in the personnel taken into custody. Mr. Margolis has given me the frequencies on which these conversations have taken place, and I've passed this on to some initials which mean nothing to me. So one thing that's confirmed is that I have actually got the story right, because I've kind of gone through life thinking, my God, did I get this all wrong? Was it a load of rubbish? And what this actually confirmed to me looking at it was not only was my information coming from Bob from BPATLP, his information, but sort of channel, <coughs> channeled through me, N not only was this incredible information, it was the only information, it was all they had. It wasn't a piece in the jigsaw puzzle, it was the jigsaw puzzle. And that came 30 years later as something of, well, frankly, it amazed me that at that stage they had nothing else. Um, I'm just, at the risk of repetition, I'm just going to show you a live thing I did for the BBC News Channel in 2012 from outside the Langham. It's repeating a bit of what I said, but puts it uh, perhaps uh, in a more, um, a more uh, understandable context. So um, if we could play that uh, Langham Hotel piece, please, Tammy. We are here um, in the West End, uh, opposite Broadcasting House, and let me explain why we're here. Up behind me is a building which is now the Langham Hotel. It's a very expensive hotel, but at the time, this is April 1982, it was a rather ropey BBC office building. But up on the top, where you're looking now, there was an amateur radio station. Now, I am a radio amateur with the call sign G3UNL. On the 2nd of April 1982, I'd been on assignment in the Middle East. I came into work and was met with scenes of near panic because the Argentines at 9.30 in the morning, our time, had claimed to have invaded the Falklands. And other than a rather laconic message from cable and wireless saying, we have new friends, there was no indication whatsoever from the islands. We had no confirmation, no news. There were no phones, no internet, nothing in those days. I was asked to go and try and use the amateur radio station, which is up on the building there, to contact the Falklands went up there and listened around for most of the afternoon and mid-afternoon I heard a familiar voice a fairly distinctive Falkland accent with a sort of West Country burr to it and I realized this was a guy I'd spoken to a couple of times over the years called Bob McLeod he was a plumber in Goose Green about 50 miles outside of Port Stanley I spoke to him and he said Laurie why is the BBC saying there's been no invasion he said there's an Argentine aircraft carrier in the bay there are Argentine troops all over town the governor and the Marines have been taken uh, have been taken prisoner the broadcast station's talking in Spanish and basically it's all over. We've been invaded by the Argentinians. I then went on Radio 4 on the PM programme. There was no continuous news in those days with this story. Was then rung shortly afterwards by somebody I thought was from the Foreign Office, but I think may have been from the, um, an intelligence officer, to ask what I knew. And I told him what I knew, that uh, it was all over. And about 50 minutes later, Lord Carrington stood up uh, as Foreign Secretary in the House of Lords and announced that the invasion had happened. Now, what has really amazed me about these papers, which um, have come out today, is how crucial that information I gave them was. First of all, to be honest, I'd forgotten how much detail there was there. Thank heavens it was right. And I, it really was the basis for pretty much everything they knew in those first hours. It was the only intelligence, it was the only hard information. The chap I was speaking to, Bob McLeod, was not in Port Stanley, he was 50 miles away, but they had a very good VHF uh, link up around the islands and his information was good. As it turned out, it was spot on. And um, th that is how the day developed. Okay, so um, that's how um, I told that story on the, on the BBC News Channel in, in 2012. Now, you might ask, well, where did this go next? Um, I, my, my involvement actually tailed off fairly quickly then because my interest was in getting this story on the air. And obviously, as the Argentines found out through the islands, what we could actually say became, uh, became far more constrained. So I carried on speaking to Bob for a couple of days and we, we got a couple more stories out of it. But uh, he, Goose Green was taken over fairly soon afterwards. He was obviously shut down and had to be very careful what uh, he was doing. Uh, there was all sorts of stuff going on right through the occupation. So there was clandestine stuff not, not involving me. Um, I, wasn't, I wasn't involved in this at all, but involving other radio amateurs. Um, some quite brave um, people on the Falklands who were getting information out. And... Um, it uh, it carried on pretty much up to the up to the day of liberation, which was in which was in June. 
So, but uh, my involvement at that stage sort of stopped. And in fact, I ended up spending much of the rest of the year back in the Middle East where um, the Israelis invaded Lebanon and there was a very bloody battle there. And I was uh, around Lebanon, uh, Israel, uh, Jordan and uh, Cyprus for, for much of the rest of that year. So what, what I would say about this, and it's, it is now the 40th anniversary, this story has followed me around for, um, for all this time and every 10 or five years, there's some reason why it comes back into focus again. Um, what I would say is at that time, and I will tell you another story where a similar thing happened shortly, amateur radio was the sole source of information for several hours, there was nothing else. There was cable and wireless were closed down there was no there, there, there were no phone calls there was a local radio station which was transmitting but obviously that couldn't be heard much beyond much beyond the islands so amateur radio was the sole source of information for that enormous story enormous world story and uh, i happened to be the one who was sitting there sort of sort of channeling it through um a couple of follow-up bits i'm quite proud to say i'm now an exhibit in not one but two museums the um, FT200 I used is now on exhibition at the National Radio Museum at Bletchley Park, which um, <clears throat> Bletchley Park, if you haven't been, is brilliant. It's where the, the whole um, the, the huge intelligence effort during the war to um, break the German codes took place. So it's a, it's a great place to go. And within that is the National Radio Museum, which has a very good amateur radio station and is, is rather well done. So the transceiver is there with a little bit about me. And I'm also now in the Imperial War Museum, um, one of the um, amateur, amateurs formerly at the BBC, Jonathan Kempster, M5AEO. He's now an archivist for the Imperial War Museum, and he came and did a very, very long interview with me. It was it was um, went on for about <laughs> about two hours and it wasn't really a broadcast interview. It wasn't something that I thought was going to go on the air. It was almost more like being interviewed by the police or something, but it's sort of seemed to start with my primary school days and, and, and uh, went on went on through there. And um, Jonathan sort of squeezed all the juice out of the, um, the orange, which is my knowledge of this thing, um, produced a video and written archive, which is now in the Imperial War Museum. I think there is actually an exhibition in the Imperial War Museum about the Falklands, which um, I should certainly try and get to. And um, he proposed a radio piece to the Broadcasting House program on Sunday, which some of you may have heard. He did a lovely, lovely edit, um, weaving together the original audio from Bob McLeod and my interview. Worked into a very nice five minutes. If you Google Broadcasting House Radio 4 and then call up the program for the 3rd of April and then go 40 minutes in, 40 minutes and 30 seconds in, you get about five minutes of me telling uh, telling you much of what I've just told you just now, but uh, <clears throat> it sounds quite good, and I was I was very pleased that got on, and Jonathan's efforts were uh, were well worthwhile. So I, I I don't know if this format, if anybody wants to ask any questions about the Falklands, I'm quite happy to do that. Otherwise, I'm going to go on to a, another story. I'm slightly unusual as a journalist because three times in my life I have rather spending decades covering stories. I've actually been the story. This was one of them. There were two other occasions. One of them was when my car was blown up by the IRA outside uh, Television Centre in, I think, uh, 2001, um, blown sky high. The last time I saw it was being loaded onto a trailer in a picture on the front of the Times. <clears throat> so that was, I was in the middle of that. And then there is a further um, amateur radio story. But do we want to take any questions about the Falklands now or shall I carry on? Well, we can do, um, Laurie, although I'm, I'm, I'm wondering about the dubious nature of being in a museum. I'm not sure if that's good or bad really at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, but one thing I think we, we'd like to play, wouldn't we, is what you did on Saturday before you move on to another yes. story. Do you know something? I forgot all about that. That's I'm sorry. Right. Let, me, let, let me go ahead. Thank you for reminding me, David. Let me go ahead with that. Um, we reprised the contact on Saturday. So Bob and I... Um, got together and um, we, we tried a couple of days during the week and conditions were just awful but fortunately they picked up and uh, starting off on 10 meters and then going to 15 meters we we reprised the contract that the co contract for contact um, with, um, with with some success it's very nice to uh, talk to him and hear him uh, his signal actually with me wasn't that good but um, another amateur in Norfolk G4T UK who seems to have a wonderful setup and location got a really good recording of both him and me, far better than I got. 
So um, the audio you hear, I think, is mostly sourced by him. But let's uh, let's just run that piece. Golf Bravo 100, Bravo, Bravo, Charlie, a GB 100 BBC. Bob, just take me back to 40 years ago, this morning, 40 years ago, when we were talking, uh, you were telling me about the invasion and uh, it was all came as, as news to us. An absolute bombshell. What, what, what were your feelings that morning, Bob, over? Golf Bravo 100, BBC, Victor Papa 8, Lima Papa. Okay, uh, Laurie. Well, I think our feelings are very, very different to uh, 40 years ago. Uh, 40 years ago, it was just uh, a very uh, sort of desperation to get the information out. And when we made contact with you uh, and, and, and got the rest of the world to, uh, to understand that the invasion had taken place, but today, everybody is very happy, very different uh, attitude. Everyone is uh, uh, preparing and all kinds of exciting events for the rest of the time. A Golf Bravo 100 BBC, Victor Papa 8, Alima Papa in Port Stanley on the Falkland Island. Yeah, very good, Bob. Lovely copy now. VP8 LP in Port Stanley <coughs> and GB100 BBC in London. Uh, that's excellent, Bob. Very, very good copy indeed. Tell us about what happens over the next couple of months. I know uh, you commemorate many of the landings and the final uh, the final victory. T tell us about what happens over the next couple of months, Bob, over. Oh, oh VP8 Lima, Papa, returning. Uh, well, uh, I think from, from our point of view, we'll be very active around the 21st of May. The Amateur Radio Society will be are very active around the 21st of May and of course uh, we also operate from uh, uh, operate from museum museum weekend uh, there's always a VP8 activity there and of course the the, the Falklands will be uh, yes, no. uh, uh -oh. commemorating quite a lot of the events and they will also have a a fairly big party, I understand, on the 14th of June, of course. But other than that, uh, Laurie, a uh, Golf Bravo 100 BBC, Victor Papa 8, Alima Papa in Port Stanley. Okay, VP8 LP in Port Stanley from GB100 BBC in London. Very good, Bob. OK, so uh, that was what we did on Saturday. And I should explain that the GB100 BBC call sign is one that uh, we are using at the BBC or in, in amateur radio employees of the BBC are using throughout this year. It's the centenary of the BBC this year. Actually, the actual date is October the 18th. But um, that call is moving round many operators. I've made quite a number of QSOs, so lots of other people. And um, if you hear us on, and there, there is usually somebody around using it across um, a wide range of frequencies and modes, please, uh, please uh, call in. And I should also say that uh, Bob there, VP8LP, is, is very active. Um, he's got a good station down there, has a very good signal. Normally, he's, he's done a lot on 10 metres recently. He seems to like being on 28495 and um, has, has a heck of a good signal there. And also thanks to uh, G4T UK for the um, quality of that transmission. Um, uh, Dave, are we taking any questions now or yep. shall, I move, shall I move on? Absolutely, Laurie. Thank you very much. Yes, so if you haven't asked a question or made a comment or anything yet about this particular part of Laurie's presentation before we move on to something else, then you can do. Just either ask it on YouTube chat or on the BATC messaging. And please don't forget to include your first name and your call sign if you have one as well. Uh, we've got a couple of comments. Firstly, I, I must mention um, Paul M1AIB, who says he was formerly VP8DBQ. So there we are, someone from the island. So he'll know exactly what we're talking about and the place yeah. that we're talking about there. Well, I don't know if Paul was there with the military or what, but um, there have been a lot of VP8 call signs um, issued over the last few years. Absolutely. Uh, Mark uh, 2E0HSE says, did the Argentinians not know about our radio amateurs on the island as they made no attempt to jam or were they listening in? This all developed very quickly. Um, I don't know whether they did. They, they pro probably should have done. But bear in mind, we are talking about a few hours after the invasion. In other words, from um, from nine o'clock in the morning, our time, when, when they actually invaded, it was sort of dawn down there. 
um, through to the late evening hour time and then a couple of days afterwards. I tell you what there was, there was certainly deliberate QRMing from LUs. They came across Pirate and all this kind of thing. They feel, they, they still feel very strongly about it. Um, I, we, we were on a trip to Brazil and Argentina some years ago and we were in Brazil and went over the border into Argentina to look at their side of the Iguazu Falls. And um, as we go over the border, there, there's a great big sign there, Malvinas Argentinas. And I screamed at the bus driver, Brazilian bus driver, I said, please stop, I must take a picture. The Brazilians found this hysterically funny. Um, but uh, it, it's, it remains a major issue in Argentina. We were in Buenos Aires a few years ago, and there is a huge permanent demonstration in the centre of Buenos Aires by Falklands veterans who have been given a pretty raw deal. Um, not, not protesting against the British or the, the British occupation, but against the way they were treated by their own military um, after, um, after all this happened. So it, it remains a major issue. But um, certainly in terms of official jamming, no. In terms of unofficial deliberate interference by LU stations, yes. Thanks, Laurie. Uh, William GI8WFA says, this is exciting and Laurie is simply brilliant at his job. Thank goodness he made the ham contact and collected important detail. Well done, Laurie, he says. OK, well, a happy licence fee pay. We're always happy to see that. I think we've got another one as well because we've got uh, Terence Tui, there's two of them. Tui Zero IPK says, last time I was watching Laurie, I had a lightning strike take out my equipment. Hang on. No, nothing around this time, he said. But in seriousness, he also concludes, um, and I'm sure we'd all agree, you're the right person at the right time. I mean, that was fortuitous, wasn't it? Yeah, I suppose so. I mean, I'm a, you know, I've always been a, been a radio ham since I was, uh, got my licence when I was 15. Always been a DXer, so know my way around the bands. And um, I'm also a journalist, so because I'm nosy and want to uh, find things out and tell other people about them. So, so um, yes, and, there, there's, uh, I guess that's, uh, that's true. And you had the channels in, obviously, to know where to take that and to get it uh, noticed. I'm sure if one of us heard something extraordinary on the radio, it might take a little bit more than it did for you to be able to get it on the air. So I think he's right. Right person, right time as well. Um, Paul uh, M1AIB says, I've worked Bob a couple of times from the UK. Sadly, in all the visits, I never actually got around to meeting him. I was there regularly as a civilian contractor at MPA in the mid 90s to around 2008. That was a gentleman who's got a, uh, yeah, a, a call sign there um, and, and lots of other just lovely compliments and brilliant presentations and everything else. So just another reminder for you at home now, if you have got any uh, questions or comments about this or about what uh, Laurie's about to tell you, then please put them on to uh, YouTube chat or on the BATC and we'll be sure to relay them to Laurie. But back to you now, Laurie. OK, well, I'm, I'm going to go on now to an, another story. I'm going to do this fairly briefly, actually, because uh, cause it's uh, the purpose of this was to talk about the Falklands and that's why I'm here. But um, we're going to go back 12 years and we're going to move from the Falklands to the Middle East. Um, oddly enough, this was another story which developed while I was abroad and sort of came home and blundered into it. So a uh, summer of 1970, um, I was working in, as a camp counsellor in the United States in Pennsylvania. And to be honest, it wasn't going very well. I actually got fired. I haven't been fired for many jobs, but I got fired from that one. Um, then <clears throat> spent some time working in a department store, which was a much happier experience. And then had to come back early because I'd rather messed up my first year university exams and had to do some resit. So I came back at the beginning of September um back to my home which was then in east london and uh, as a rather unusual situation there because here where i am in northwest london the antennas i've got are very simple um i've got dipoles wire antennas wire verticals and that sort of thing hanging from a tree um it works reasonably well it's a reasonably good location but it, it's a fairly modest station back in ilford because my father was a radio ham he died many years ago but he was g3 nmr we had a really good setup. We had a 60 foot tower with a six element beam on the top in, in a rather small garden. I don't think the neighbors ever quite got over it. And uh, we had a decent station for the times. We had the, uh, the Heath SB line, the SB 401 and 303 and 200. And um, probably one of the loudest signals from the UK at that time. So we worked a lot of DX and it was, it was good fun. What had been happening in the Middle East was that a civil war had developed in Jordan King Hussein of Jordan was under enormous pressure by the Palestine Liberation Organization, who had been effectively forced out of Palestine by the Israeli victory in the Six Day War in 1967. Many of them were in Jordan, huge Palestinian population in Jordan. 
and they were effectively trying to take over the country. So there was a civil war in Jordan. And of course, what I would point out there is those of you who've been around a bit longer will know that King Hussein of Jordan was a very keen radio ham. He was JY1, so you can probably see where this is going. And I had worked JY1 um, a few months before. I'd worked him on March the 20th, 1970. Um, here is the QSL card. Here is the, uh, his handwritten message on the back from the, the king of the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan. I had heard him about six months before March the 20th. And to be honest, I was more excited. The fact that I'd never worked Jordan before. It was a new country for me. It was pretty rare in those days. So to work the king. And this um, handwritten QSL said, it was a pleasure for me to contact you, my very good friend. I hope we will have a future contact soon. We did. Kindly accept my best wishes and regards. Sincerely, Hussein. And I remember even at the time of thinking, if he wrote cards like that, at that length, he's going to be spending a lot of time writing QSL cards. I think he got a, got a QSL manager soon afterwards. So there was JY1. There was this war going on and all communications went down. Again, stop me if this sounds familiar, similar story. And, and we are even earlier. We're now in 1970s. So television communications are more rudimentary. They're not really satelliting stuff back. Um, uh, material is film it is flown back to London or New York or somewhere where it can be processed may not get on the air for a day or so it still worked remarkably well it was amazing what got back but it was really it was really pretty basic and again communications were the phone and telex no no mobile phones no no uh, emails nothing no internet no zoom <laughs> nothing like that obviously and um I came back from so back in London back at back at the family home my mum and dad and brother and um, not the happiest bunny, to be honest, because I'm going to have to take these exams and I've had to cut short my stay in the States. And listening that evening, uh, one evening, a um, couple of weeks into September, late at night on 20 metres, I hear this enormous signal, which is clearly JY1, huge signal, talking to friends in the States and saying, you know, it's very difficult and we are doing our best and there's very heavy fighting and... Uh, um, you know, we're, we're, we're fighting for our lives. And so, crikey, that's quite interesting. So my mother was a lady called Sylvia Margolis, who um, older viewers may remember, she was actually the first uh, public relations officer for the Radio Society of Great Britain back in the um, late 60s. Never, never took her ham license, always claimed Ohm's law should be repealed, but was actually fascinated by the hobby and particularly by the people we met and the sort of exposure it gave you to the to the wider world which um, was un unusual in those days and she was or had also become a radio journalist she'd become quite well known on woman's hour and various radio four programs and had a bit of a relationship with the today program as well which then as of now is, is a morning current widely listened to morning current affairs program and it must have been about half past 11 at night and i crept upstairs and i could see they were still awake and i said um if you were a king in the middle of a country, you know, surrounded by enemies, fighting a civil war, no communications, full, full scale battles going on around your country, would you be sitting on 20 meters talking to people in Minneapolis? And she agreed that this sounded an unlikely state of affairs. So anyway, we, we recorded some of this stuff. And my mum called a contact on the Today program early next morning of Today, today Radio Car black taxi with a great big aerial which uh, those were in use actually till quite recently um they are around they pick up this tape they play it and uh, there is the king of jordan explaining what is going on when there is nothing else coming out of jordan at all absolutely nothing you look at the newspapers they're all date lined in in nicosia and in beirut and places like that um and um it was a pretty good story anyway i then heard him on again and called him and said, uh, you know, I was in, in London. And by this stage, because this stuff had gone on the air, although I hadn't actually spoke to him, it had gone into the papers with my name next to it. And we suddenly had an awful lot of press interest. We had uh, French television, American television. I remember CBS came there. ITN were there. BBC were there. Um, and um, if we can run now, Tammy, a piece of uh, fairly superannuated videotape but from well, it was film actually from the time please so you'll see what it looked like um go ahead 
JY1, G3 United Mexico Lima in London. G3 United Mexico Lima in London, over. Hello, uh, G3 uh, United Mexico Lima. Uh, G3 uh, United. Roger, Your Majesty, good evening. This is G3 UNL near London. Um, I'm just listening to you talking. I don't know whether we can assist you at all in contacting your wife. I am quite close to London. You could uh, get in touch with the embassy, uh, with Miss May. May. Please repeat that name if you can. JY1, G3 UNL, go ahead. Roger, what is the number? What is the number, over? Uh, just stand by one night check. Roger. I have both those numbers. What is the message, please? What is the message, please? Over. Uh, just uh, to uh, pass uh, Princess Mona and the family uh, my very best and uh, to give them all is fine and we're all fine here and uh, not to worry, over. Uh, Roger, okay, fine. Um, I don't know if you can say how things are there and how you are. I presume everything is fine. <coughs> very glad to hear you and I will be listening out for you and uh, if there is any other mes message to come back, I will be around here. Uh, JY1, G3, UNL, go ahead. Okay, well, you haven't got to be the greatest journalist in the world to realise that the king of a country, of an Arab country, talking to a 20-year-old Jewish student in East London and telling him uh, what's going on, the only person getting any sort of voice out of the country, you haven't got to be the greatest journalist in the world to work out it's not a bad story. <clears throat> and it, it rattled around for about two weeks. We had the papers over, we had foreign television over, as I say. That piece of tape, actually, that went out on ITN, but um, that was before I worked for the BBC. It was about four years before I went into, into, uh, into the BBC, so I wasn't sort of uh, being naughty. And I, I only discovered that quite recently. I didn't even know that existed until relatively recently when um, just messing around with Google, suddenly this extraordinary piece of, uh, piece of TV came up. So that... Um, we, we carried on talking for a couple of days, then it sort of died away and the press interest died away a bit. And then about two weeks later, there was used to be an early evening news programme called Nationwide. And um, Nationwide was a, it used to come on, the main BBC news used to come on at quarter to six or 20 to six. And then at six o'clock, there was this programme which began with the local programme, those local programmes still exist now, shown at half past six and then followed a kind of national thing, a bit like the one show, which covered all sorts of stories. And Nationwide came over, they wanted to film a background piece and uh, they were, they'd were they obviously been busy all day. They'd been filming some murder story or something. And I, at that stage, I said, oh, you know, I'm not sure he's gonna be around. I said, I can show you how amateur radio works, but <clears throat> I couldn't really quite see what the story was. Anyway, they came in and they set up and um, started filming a bit. And I think I called CQ and worked, worked somebody in Lithuania, I think. And then suddenly blasting out of the speaker is, um, hello, my good friend, uh, JY1. And the room, there was this kind of electric charge went through the room. And I said, well, it's him. And we proceeded to have a contact um, which uh, went out um, was recorded by the nationwide people who were really pretty pleased to get this because we've not heard from him for a while and to be honest the information he was giving me was fairly fairly basic trouble and we're doing our best and losses and uh, it's very difficult and difficult for the people but you know coming from the king of the country it uh, it became quite a good story um a little postscript to that about um three months later he won his battle against the plo he he 
basically crushed the rebellion and carried on in control of, of Jordan with some difficulty. He um, then was suffering from exhaustion, came to London, was in hospital, was in a small clinic in the West End of London, stuck a beam up on the roof, which I don't think anybody else would have managed, but you know, when you're a king, things happen. And my father and I were invited up to meet him. And it was the most extraordinary thing. There's no, um, I haven't even got any still pictures of it, I don't think, of the meeting. It was, uh, it was a, a very private thing, but um, we went to this clinic, up we go. There he is sitting in a fairly modest little hospital room, recuperating, wearing his dressing gown and pajamas. I remember with a lot of sort of RAF type um, novels and background books on, on his shelf. And we just had a chat and I, my dad, him, <laughs> and um, his, uh, his chief aide at the embassy. And um, it, was, it was an extraordinary moment, as I say, of which there is unfortunately no, no electronic or even video record. But uh, that is the King Hussein story. So twice in my life, major, major stories, huge world stories have come to light through amateur radio. I've been lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time if you like it's perhaps it's a bit more than luck it's knowing your way around these things but um they've been two extraordinary episodes could it happen again now well communications are far more robust now i mean you look at ukraine this country under the most brutal bombardment and yet we are still seeing pictures we are seeing phone calls we are seeing live live links it's it's much harder to get the toothpaste back in the tube now if you're a repressive regime and trying to shut someone up um, it really is quite hard. Of course, in Ukraine, all the radio amateurs are closed down, but um, I'm sure lots of them are involved in monitoring and, um, and all sorts of stuff. So that is that story. So I think um, you've probably heard enough from me, but those are the, those are the two uh, things I'm going over. As I said, if there's any further questions, I'm more than happy to help out. Thank you ever so much, Laurie. Actually, one of the questions I wanted to ask you, so I'll ask it anyway, because you, you've alluded to it there, is, I mean, do you think in this 21st century when we've got internet and satellite phones and everything, is there still a place for amateur radio or something like this? Because surely we don't need any infrastructure, do we? There's nothing, there's nothing really to block except the basic RF signal. So is there yeah. still a place? I mean, could this still be a lifeline for a Theoretically. country? Theoretically. Theoretically, yes. I mean, you know, the internet requires infrastructure. It requires, uh, <coughs> excuse me, ground, ground stations. It requires um, cabling out or satellite links out. It requires a lot of kit to make it work. And there is, of course, everywhere in the world now, every corner of the world, there is a lot of kit which can make it work. But if you get a situation, either a major disaster or, or some huge um, political clampdown of sorts, so that things like the internet and mobile phones and... Uh, and emails are not working then amateur radio as you say you know all we need is we need some power but that's it as long as you've got your transceiver and you can hang a piece of wire from a tree you're on the air and uh, it's it is the simplicity of the thing which is its power whether we will get stories like these breaking again through amateur radio i'm i'm not sure if we do i hope i'm there but um um, I, I, I don't know, but uh, yes, theoretically it can happen, of course. Third time lucky, Laurie, I'm sure. Maybe. Um, really wonderful, wonderful compliments, honestly, coming in. I can't, I mean, a word such as spellbinding and brilliant presentation and things, honestly, fantastic show, thanks. Everything coming very in kind, for you. Very kind of people, thank you. Um, there really is, uh, there's somebody else uh, now, um, Tim, GW4VXE. But he did just mention as well, just on the, on the piece you've just talked about as well, can you imagine passing that phone number over the air now? Um, <laughs> yeah. um, but that was he, actually in the Jordanian embassy in London. Oh, OK. Uh, he did ask, um, though, about the Falkland story now and said, did Laurie meet any of the other guys feeding information to Bob? So, sorry, about the what story? About This is the Falkland story before, oh, oh, right. not King Hussein. He said, did Laurie meet any of the other guys feeding information to Bob? No, I didn't. Um, I, I, I haven't been to the islands. I'm, I'm hoping to go, but um, I, I've never been there. And uh, my my dealing with the islands has been at eight thousand miles distance on uh, fifteen and fifteen and ten meters. So no, I have. I mean, there's one or two other people I know down there. There's one other, you know, keen DXer who I'm, I know. But um, I, I I have not met any of the other people who supplied that information. No. Let let me ju just um, qualify that a bit. There was a guy. Um, he was like the only journalist on the island called Patrick Watts. And he used to run, he was actually used to be a stringer, a sort of um, 
part-time correspondent for the BBC. Of course, there wasn't much to report on the Falkland Islands before all this happened. But um, he was a fairly well-known figure on the local radio station. He presented lots of stuff there. And he was the guy who kind of carried on. In other words, he was transmitting when these, uh, when these people turned up and stormed into the studio. And then for a while it was in Spanish. And then later on, he was allowed to come back on in English, re really passing sort of health and welfare stuff. And I think, I think trying to sort of say to people, you know, behave yourselves, you'll be okay. So um, Patrick, I've never met him, but I uh, believe he's still around. He played a very central role in this, but otherwise, no, I, I'm, I've not met any of the others. No, and I guess a lot of what, what Bob was seeing was from through his own eyes. He was just giving you a witness, eyewitness report about what he was seeing himself. Well, not, not at the beginning, he, because he was 50 miles away. Okay. So what he was reporting was what he was being told on this two metre net. In other words, this two metre net was alive. I don't know whether the Argentinians knew it was there or, or whatever happened. I mean, all these communications were closed down fairly quickly. But at that stage, I don't think anything was happening in Goose Green. It was quiet. Goose Green was taken over later and then was the scene of that very bloody battle. I should just mention, by the way, I don't know whether any of you saw <clears throat> Channel 4 did a documentary about two weeks ago looking at the whole story and had some quite controversial views from very senior military people about the campaign itself. And the, the, their argument was that we lost focus in going for Port Stanley. Um, Goose Green was because they claimed Mrs. Thatcher wanted, you know, some something to wave in front of people that what we were hearing about was boats being sunk and she wanted a victory and she got one, albeit at considerable cost. And the whole thing which led to the sinking of the Sir Galahad, the Bluff Cove um, attacks very late on, um, also did not need to happen. Now, I am merely reporting this. I have no views on it one way or the other. I don't know enough about it. But some fairly senior military people were on this programme. And if you're interested, it's probably worth sorting out for another view. Absolutely. I think that, that will be really interesting, Laurie. Uh, Laurie, I think that finishes our main uh, questions and comments uh, for you. I will just say, though, you and I have done this sort of thing once before for our own local club here in Norfolk. And I can tell you that using that gentleman's name, uh, word spellbinding, it's still as spellbinding for me now as it was just over a year ago when we first did it. So thank you ever so much for tonight. I know that you've inspired lots of other people, maybe encouraged them even into journalism. Who knows from what, you're, what you've told us. But you were the right person at the right place. And we thank you very much indeed for coming on tonight today and sharing that with us. OK, well, you know, I'm not sure how many people are out there or where they are, but all I can see is myself and you. But um, uh, thank you very much for listening. I hope you found it interesting. These have been major, major events in my life. Um, I am I am still working. I'm in the office tomorrow um, and it's uh, I've, I've had a, a great professional life. It's uh, the whole thing about news is, you know, it's one damn thing after the other, as someone said, and um, it is really, really dull. It's often very upsetting, as recent events have proved, but um, it's also very exciting. So um, I've been very lucky in that in that sense. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Laurie. And there, that then concludes this webinar. And thanks once again to our guest presenter, Laurie Margolis, G3UML. Thanks also to studio director, Tammy M0TC, sitting just to my left, and also the RSGB team behind the scenes who helped to put this work on the programme together. We hope you've enjoyed this tonight to date and that you'll be able to join us next time when Mark Haynes, M0 at DXR, will talk about pushing the boundaries in contesting. And if you'd like to see details of future webinars or recordings of past editions, please visit rsgb.org forward slash webinars, where you can also send us comments and feedback. And a reminder that if you subscribe to the RSGB's YouTube channel, you'll be notified of all upcoming Tonight at 8 webinars, as well as other new videos and presentations from the Society on a wide range of amateur radio topics. But until next time, this is David G7ERP signing off and clear. Bye-bye.